Now I'd like to actually derive the formula that we found for the acceleration. Where did that actual formula come from? There's many ways to derive this. The one that I'm going to do here is geometric. Hold on and pause the video as often as you need to so that you can stop and make sense of what's going on. First we'll define the system. I've got a rotation. I'm putting it in the counterclockwise direction, which is our typical trigonometric convention, characterized by a radius of the path r. We need to know velocity to understand acceleration, so we need to characterize the velocity. And how we can characterize the velocity? Well, it's the rate of change of position, or the change of position divided by the change in time. We'll look at two events close together in time. At the first event, the object is at r0 at time 0. The second event, the object is at some different r, r sub t for r at time t. In that time, it has traversed an angle, delta theta, and it's changed its position to a new position. So its position change is now delta r, with the vector as drawn in red. Now, what's the velocity doing? The object is moving in a circular path. Its velocity is tangent to the circle. That means that its velocity is perpendicular to the radius of the circle. So here's the velocity at the initial time. Here's the velocity at time t a little bit later. And notice that they've changed a little bit. The direction of the velocity vector has changed by exactly the same angle as the direction of the position vector. What we can do is draw two similar isosceles triangles. One triangle is going to have displacement vectors as the two long sides and the change in the displacement vector as the short side. The other similar triangle is going to have velocity vectors as the two long sides with the change in velocity vector as its short side. The two velocity vectors have the same length because they have the same speed. And then we have the base angle being the change in velocity vector. So these are similar triangles in that the ratio of the length of delta v to v is the same as the ratio of the length delta r to r. We're going to use this equivalence to derive our formula for the actual magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. Delta v over v equals delta r over r. I divided both sides by delta t. But what is this now, delta v over delta t, that I've got on the left-hand side of the equation? Delta v over delta t is just the acceleration. And on the right-hand side of the equation, I have delta r over delta t. Why, that's just the velocity. So we can make those substitutions into the equation. So where we have delta v over delta t on the left, we'll plug in a. Where we have delta r over delta t on the right, we'll plug in v. So now a over v equals v over r. Multiply both sides by v. And here's what we get. Acceleration is v squared over r. I invite you, if you don't get it right away, which I certainly didn't when I first saw this proof, go back and work through it again yourself. So let's review what this is telling us. Here's our velocity triangle, initial velocity, final velocity, change in velocity, acceleration vector as a result of this triangle as v squared over r. The direction of the acceleration is 90 degrees from the direction of the velocity, just as the direction of velocity was 90 degrees from the direction of the displacement. The direction of the displacement is outward from the origin point, the center of the circle. 180 degrees beyond that is right down into the center of the circle. So now we've fully characterized the acceleration vector. It always points directly toward the center of the circle, and it always has a magnitude of v squared over r. When I'm saying always, that's in the condition of uniform circular motion. So this direction is constantly changing in uniform circular motion. The displacement is constantly rotating. It's constantly circling above the center. The velocity is constantly rotating. It's making a constant circle. The acceleration is also constantly rotating. It's making the same constant circle and they're traversing the same angle in the same time. So the displacement, the velocity, and the acceleration all have the same angular speed. That's kind of cool. I'd like to take a similar view now to look at the other way we've expressed the magnitude of the acceleration in terms of angular quantities. Again, looking at the object circling, we have a constant radius and a velocity that's constant in magnitude but constantly changing in direction. We have a circumference, a distance through which the object travels in one cycle of 2 pi times the radius, 2 pi r. The time it takes to complete one cycle is t. The speed is 2 pi r over t, the distance traversed divided by the time. Velocity is also tracing out a circle at a speed of a, because that's the rate of change of the velocity. The radius of this circle 
though it's not a real physical circle, this is a conceptual mathematical circle, the radius of this circle is the speed. So the circumference of this circle, perfectly valid mathematically, is 2 pi r times v. Thus the acceleration, which is going to be the circumference divided by the time, is going to be 2 pi v over t. Then what we're going to do is just plug in our previous expression for v in for v where we see it in that expression for acceleration. So the previous expression for v was 2 pi r over t. Expression for acceleration is 2 pi v over t. When you combine those two, we have 2 pi times 2 pi r over t, all divided by t. We can simplify that, and we have 4 pi squared r over t squared. Or equivalently, 4 pi squared r f squared, because f, the frequency, is just 1 over the period t.